Hello, everybody. Welcome to Esoteric Atlanta. Of course, my name is Bryce. I'm here with my friend and your friend is Stephanie from Spiritual Perspectives of Our Great Awakening and a new friend, Emmy, who has her own channel now. And I'm going to show you guys quickly before we get into the topic at hand. So, of course, if you have not subscribed to Stephanie, please go ahead and subscribe to Stephanie at Spiritual Perspectives of Our Great Awakening. Of course, as always, I will be placing links to their channels down in the description box below. And then Emmy's channel is Holistic Genie with Emmy. And you've literally, how many videos do you have, Emmy? Not that many so far, right? No, just I think six or seven. And seven, I think. Yeah. So you guys, um, Emmy, you're a, are you a master Reiki? What level are you with Reiki? Um, I've taken um, Holy Fire Usui Master and Karuna Master. So awesome. Yeah. So your channel is kind of dedicated to spiritual healing, right? Yeah. It's basically a collection of holistic health topics, anywhere from physical health to spirituality. Um, I've, I've had a lot of growth and healing in my life and I've used these avenues to get there. And I just like to share with everyone how I've healed and it, I'm a completely different person than I was five years ago. If someone were to tell me five years ago that I would put myself on YouTube, I would have laughed so hard. (laughs) Same, same, (laughs) same, same. same. (laughs) <laughs> we were right texting here. beforehand because i know it's so super it's it's nerve-wracking when you first open your channel but you do get used to it and i was telling them some days i wonder if i can get away with not showering <laughs> I do shower. <laughs> some days you're lucky if i got pants on <laughs> <laughs> you know it just you get very used to it and um <laughs> you know, you develop a different, it's a different kind of lesson. You know, everything in life is a chance to grow and learn and, and experience your own personal growth and lessons. And having a channel definitely teaches you a lot about yourself, especially when you're put under the public eye in that kind of a way. And you, you did it to yourself, you know, like you put yourself up there. So um, now I, I, one thing I love about what you're doing, Emmy, I know Stephanie and I have spoken a lot about this and this is kind of my um, this is my job before YouTube and not just, I don't I hate to say it was just my job because it's, it's my life too, is, is, um, you know, of course I've studied in India and, and really starting to kind of change the way that we perceive our bodies in the Western world. We're taught that, you know, you have the body and the soul, which in the yoga sutras it's Prakriti and Purusha, but Prakriti is the Shakti of the soul and something in the East that's different from the West is when there is an issue with health we're not just looking at something you inherited or just a, just a basic biological uh, dysfunction. It's looking at what energetically caused it. And I, I say a lot of times my teacher in India, I don't even know if he like knows where your kidneys are, you know, and it doesn't matter because he's looking at you energetically. And once you fix the energetic, the body then follows suit because the body is the GPS system of where the soul is out of alignment. Um, and of course it's much deeper than that. I do simplify it here by saying soul and a lot of Eastern philosophy that goes into like Atman, which is even deeper than the soul. And so, um, well, Emmy, first of all, uh, just to introduce yourself to my audience, how did you find Reiki? How did you, how did you wonder as a Westerner, as a white girl from America, like, how did you stumble upon this, this modality from how all of us were raised in the Western world? Well, I was introduced to Reiki by a friend. And she was very gentle with it because she knew my religious background. background. Um, I grew up in a Christian church. And when I met my first husband at 17, he was Catholic. And so I joined the Catholic church and was uh, pretty much well indoctrinated after that. And you know, there were, there were some things about it that I liked, um, but I could tell uh, intuitively, even though I squashed my intuition back then, that something just wasn't quite right. I, I did not, I, I felt most uncomfortable with having to talk through a priest to God. It's like, why? <laughs> that makes no sense to me. Um, so yeah, I, I had a little bit of, um, religious indoctrination. Um, and 
I completely lost my train of thought. What was your question initially? I did find Reiki. <laughs> What's so funny? Oh all yeah, find us- Reiki. Yeah. So okay, so I had a friend, and she was very careful um, with how she approached me with it, and I'm I'm very grateful for that. Um, but I had uh, an issue with my ankle, and she kept offering to do a uh, Reiki treatment on me, and I couldn't get rid of this issue with my ankle for weeks. And so I decided to go see her and I wanted to test it. So I didn't tell her about my ankle and the set, the session was profound. Like I could feel the energy. I could feel swirling around my head. I could feel like this gentle tugging, pulling, there was tingling everywhere. Like I just felt the energy and it felt like warm sunshine flowing through my body. It was incredibly relaxing. I don't think I've ever been so relaxed up to that point in my life. It was, it was almost like I have been in a constant state of fight, flight, freeze, or fawn my entire life. <laughs> I've went from one abusive situation to another. And not that they were horrible all the time because abuse can be really subtle. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so I had the healing session with her and some very powerful, intuitive messages came through. Um, God was just speaking directly to me. And, you know, he told me, you're a healer. You know, you're a healer. You have to do this. And I was compelled after that. Um, It was one of the most profound spiritual experiences I have ever had. And I asked her for another session a week or two after that. And during that session, Um, I felt my mom's, my mom's passed away. I felt my mom's hands on the top of my head. Her hands were resting on my shoulders and I felt a second set of hands come down on my head. And immediately when they touched my head, I knew it was my mom and my friend, Holly, she sensed it also. And at the same time, we both went, your mom. And I went, my mom. I'm like, oh my gosh, you know? And then at that point in time, I had lost my entire family of origin, both my parents, both my siblings, grandparents. Um, And I started to feel these hands being placed all over my body. And it was my family telling me, hey, we're here. We've been here the whole time, girl. (laughs) It was so profound. And that kind of blew the doors wide open to um, energy and energy medicine. And so, um, I took my first class from someone who I had known growing up in middle school and high school. And I had known that she taught Reiki, um, because she invited me to a lot of stuff on Facebook, but I just never went because I knew nothing about it. And it wasn't an interest to me at the time. So I took my first two classes and it was absolutely incredible. And there were these, you know, very deep seated religious beliefs that um, kept coming up, like, you know, those, those unwritten, unspoken rules, like anything that is outside of the scope of religion is satanic or demonic, you know, anything that I don't understand is, is not good for me. So I kept asking, you know, very close with Jesus, I've had a relationship with him even before I learned about him in religion. I kept asking, okay, give me a sign. If if this is not what you want me to do, show me. And he just kept leading me more and more toward it, more and more toward it. And it wasn't until after I had taken the classes and started studying energy, um, I didn't even know what a chakra was. Two years ago, two and a half years ago, I had no idea what a chakra was. Neither did I. (laughs) Now now my my whole my whole life and existence is um centered around and focused on my energy, my my spirit, my soul, you know, who, who the essence of who I am. You know, we're so attached to our bodies and we identify. Um, with our bodies, like we are our bodies. We're not our bodies. Our bodies are a vehicle. They're, they're clothing. That's what, um, that's the biggest, uh, in the yoga sutras, that's the cause of man's suffering. 
according to Patanjali, is that we are confused about who we are. We think yes. who we are is our identity in property and nature, which is our bodies. But that's, that's not who we are because it's not eternal. The soul is what's eternal. It's Purusha. And so um, that's why man suffers is because the rules of property, the two rules of property of nature of our bodies is that as a birth, a life and a death. And because it has a birth, a life and a death, that means that it's always shifting and changing. And so because and that also represents outside of our lives with our relationships, with our jobs, which, you know, even the building that the apartment I'm in right now, one day will not be here anymore. It's constantly shifting and ebbing and flowing. And we have a hard time moving with that because we want to hold on to it because we think it's, it's who we are when it's not, it's just an expression of who we are. You know, it's, it's, um, it's like you, you Purusha, your, your Atman is just watching this happen. Like you're your own reality show. Yeah. And when it's over, it's over. And that's what a lot of yoga practitioners say. Like we're practicing yoga, yoga to prepare for our own death so that we can leave the body with ease when it's time we've accepted and we leave. Um, it's so beautiful. Yeah. It's and the so body beautiful. with the chakra system, I mean, that's an easy, that's how I say the body will tell you where your soul, if that's all, if you can use the body in its proper way, it becomes this beautiful thing because it shows you, it tells you where there's disalignment, where, because it shows up in the body, it shows up as aches and pains, diseases, all this kind of stuff that shows up there. Um, and that's, um, I think our ancestors knew this. So I, even as Westerners, I think our ancestors knew this. And then, you know, of course, Stephanie and I talk a lot about the church. We both come from the, I, I think out of all three of us, I like last time I went to church, I was 17. I'm 39 now. So it's been a while. It's been a while. I'm probably um, the one that left it the last out of this group of girls here. I was, it was July of last year and it was a very, very, very profound, strong nudge from God to get like, out. It's not, yeah. it's, 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 I mean, in my opinion, the, the church is satanic. It's, it's following the rules of the, the, the well, watch what I say, the club, the club, the group, you know, it's owned by the government and they've manipulated and censored and taken away the divine feminine and um, all that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, and so, but the truth always comes out and, and the, I'll tell you before I left for my first trip to India. And again, this has been, I had not been in the church for years. So I wasn't even thinking about how would Jesus feel about me going to India? That wasn't even in my mind. And it was the night before I was leaving and I was going to be in India for a really long time. So my whole apartment was packed up. Um, every, someone was going to sublet from me while I was away. And I was on uh, Facebook and I got this message from a guy I went to high school with who I hadn't spoken to since high school. And um, he now is a minister and he sent me a message and he on, on Facebook and he said, I don't know why I need to tell you this, but Jesus was urging me to tell you that you're going somewhere because of him. He wants you there. I don't know if I've ever even told you this, Stephanie. Yeah, you did. He had no idea I was going to India the next day for a very long time. Um, and I just messaged him back and I was like, thanks, man. Like, I wasn't really worried about going to India, but I'm going to India tomorrow. So, um, you know, and I've had a lot of very, very fundamentalist Christians, like call me all sorts of names because of, uh, because I, I'm an authorized teacher and I spend a lot of time in India and, um, have a profound respect for the Hindu faith, profound respect for it. It's a very beautiful faith and it's a very loving faith. And, um, you know, and I just remember that story that you know, it sucks to be you fundamentalist because Jesus actually is the reason why, according to my friend, he sent me there. So, you know, and I see that now. I know that now. I know why I had to go there now. But um, yeah, so I get that. And it's hard that that indoctrination is hard, but it's so freeing, though, once you liberate yourself, it's yeah. like this bondage just breaks off of you. Mm -hmm. When you yeah. realize there's no you, you are enough. And guys, you're not going to hell. Like that's not going to happen. You, you're here because you're here to learn lessons and grow. And if God you don't learn you. in this lifetime, you do it again. Yeah. The mm -hmm. soul is eternal. And so as long as it takes until you realize you need to work through something and you just keep coming back. And, and a lot of the missing books of the Bible do talk about this. The missing books of the Bible talk about reincarnation. Uh, but of course the church doesn't want you to know that because how can they make money off of your fear? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You're vulnerable. If you think that's it, once, once the lights go out, that's it. But if you know, that's not it, then you're not vulnerable. Yeah. Yeah. It is. It, it is probably coming out of it and looking back 
with hindsight, it's probably the most in-depth mind control system we have on this planet. Yeah. I mean, we've got the school system and the government and, you know, workplace, but religion, I think, takes the cake. And, and they do a, a very good job at um, making us believe that Christianity and fundamentalist Christianity at that is the only right, true religion. And if you don't believe the way we believe or they believe, then you're in for, you know, an eternity of suffering. And if you can apply critical thinking to that, it just makes no sense. It makes no sense at all. Why would a loving God who created you in his image, you got, you got, both of you are parents. I'm not a parent. I have a dog. And I know my dog, I would, I would, I would take a bullet from my dog. People always laugh at me for saying that I absolutely would take a, I love my dog that much that I would take a bullet for him, but you both have children. And as a parent, and this used to confuse me when I was a little kid, I remember asking my mom about this. My mother would say to us like, you know, girls, I'm your mom. I, I love you unconditionally. And, and there's nothing you could do that would make me not love you. But then I would go to church or Sunday school and they would say, you know, God loves you, but if you don't do this or, but if you don't follow this, you're going to burn in hell. And that would always confuse me because my mother would sit there and say there's that she loved us unconditionally and there was nothing we could do to make her not love us. But yet God, who you say also loves us unconditionally, if we don't follow this exactly to a T, we're going to burn in hell. That doesn't make sense to me. And as parents, would you ever cast your child into the fiery pits of hell? No. Well, that's what happened to me. Like I was driving one day and I was, this was, I was using my critical thinking skills for once when I came to that kind of stuff. And I literally got angry and I hit the steering wheel and I'm like, God, do you really send all these people to hell? I need to know because this doesn't feel right. And God was like, well, what do you think? And I said, well, I'm told one thing, but I think another. And God was very clear. Okay. What do you think though? Like, no, then no. God wasn't just going to give me the answer. God wanted me to think about it. Um, and that's when I started to doubt the church to some degree. And I was, but it was such a hard programming to break. Um, and it took about two years to really break it. A good two years. And once I actually did, like one of the biggest things that broke it was my cards. That was, because I, I remember like I, I had this kind of like you, Emmy, with your Reiki and you, Bryce, with your yoga. It was this very, very clear voice that said, you need to buy a set of cards. I'm like, but that's sinful. I was like, you know, one of my friends did tarot. And when she would, she would ask me, do you want me to do a reading for you? And I go, I'm sure. And then I'd be like, God, am I sinning? God, am I sinning? And I never got a yes. And it just, I had to kind of force myself to do what I felt was right, even though part of me was like, am I sinning? And once I got the cards and I kept asking Jesus if I was sinning and kept getting, no, I want you to do this. And then started to find out that God can actually speak through the cards. Mm -hmm. I was like, I got more and more comfortable. And then there was like, it's almost like I had uh, these shackles that were released off of me, you know, sp- in a spiritual sense, not literally, but it was so completely liberating. And to be honest with you, if a fundamentalist gets all pissy with me or anything like that, I kind of laugh about it at this point because I'm like, sucks That's for sorry. you because it's a miserable life. That's suffering. Well, and one thing in the Yoga Sutra talks about this too, the, the more you recognize your own soul which part of that liberation is taking off the weight of the expectations of this organization and you can start to really live within your soul what happens is you start to see the beauty in other people too and you start to see the that you start to feel an intense love for other humans as well whereas before you're shackled with such fear that you can't see the beauty in other people. You can't see the beauty in the Hindu faith or the beauty in the Muslim faith. You can't see that when you're so shackled by fear. But once that is, once you're freed of that, you see, it's like Ram Dass said, like it's just God dressed in drag. 
Like every single culture has their own expression of the same God, you know, and, and you start to see, and you see how beautiful that is. And it's so freeing. And that's the, that's what Je Yahshua, Jesus spoke, love thy God with all thy heart and love each other's. I loved you. Those are his two commandments, mm -hmm. but the church doesn't even follow those commandments. So how do they expect the parishioners? And one thing I want to want to talk about too, coming out of the church and something we're going to get into with the topic today in 70, I've been kind of talking about this off screen. I'll have to be careful how I kind of, cause I know this might ruffle some feathers is the idea of karma. And here in the Western world, we have a very uneducated, ignorant idea of what karma is. Karma is just cause and effect. And in yoga, we call it your work. So everybody comes to planet earth in this carnation with karma that they are supposed to work through. Nobody else can do that work for you. You have to do that work yourself. You have to do it. So what the church does sometimes is they take that power and that's, that's your power. You working through that is your power. They take that away from you. You can't possibly do this. So we're going to put it over on this ethereal idea of whether you believe or not enough in, the, in, in a human sacrifice. And that's going to be your entrance into heaven or nirvana, whatever you want to call it, the final samadhi with God. But that's not, that's not what Yahshua taught in the missing books of the Bible. What Yahshua teaches in the missing books of the Bible mirrors the Yoga Sutras. What Mary Magdalene teaches in the Magdalene Gospel mirrors the Yoga Sutras. You have to, and that's, that's your gift, is to work through your karma. Because something very profound happens when you actually sit in your own shit, and you <laughs> actually sit in your own discomfort, and you let yourself be there, and you don't ignore it, and you whatever modality you're using to, to trigger that, and you actually sit there, and work through it. Sometimes it takes five minutes. Sometimes it takes five years. You become so much more powerful within yourself and you become so much more people's eyes shine brighter. There's more wisdom. There's more compassion. The first law of yoga is ahimsa nonviolence, which doesn't mean it also means setting up boundaries for yourself too. So you're learning how to like move throughout the, the, the world within your own self, within your own spirit, when you actually allow yourself to do your karma. And so, um, and that's something that's so beautiful in the East. And so with that being said, um, before we move into the ghosting topic, do you girls have anything you want to say about the karma? Cause I think that's something that's going to be really hard for the fundamentalist to actually realize that this isn't a bad thing. It's a power move. It's a plot twist. Like that's you your can't power. put it on an individual. You, no, your karma is your karma and it's yours alone to deal with. And when you incarnate, you have your own personal karmas, you have your um, parents' karma, um, and, and you, you know, you can choose to be the one that breaks that karma. Yeah, you have the three karmas. So the three karmas are your own karma, which is your own work from this life and past lives. You have your ancestral karma, so that's what you've inherited, which, yes, if, and they say that people who practice yoga consistently in this life will change the karmic pattern of their seven generations beneath them also cleanses seven generations behind you too. So any type of bad habits that were or work sent through your DNA, it's like we were, it might be a little bit graphic, but we were talking about that with the conception of a baby. You know, when a, when a baby is conceived, when the sperm hits the egg, there's that flash of light, but whatever vibration the man was when he released that sperm, that's now going into that child, same with the egg. And so that's why it's super important as human beings that we work on ourselves because we're giving that to our children too. And, but once that goes into that sperm and that egg meat, that's now that baby's karma that now they have to work through that. And we also have the collective karma, which is what we're all going through together right now in our timeline that we all have to work through together, which is why I'm so happy channels like Emmy and Stephanie exist, because that's my thing that I'm getting angry and frustrated with a lot of people in the truth or community is they think this is all a movie and they can just sit back, eat popcorn and watch the Kennedys fix it. No. Or they think this is about... It's, it's more uh, either political or more religious. And when I say religious, I don't mean spiritual. That's why I don't, my channel's not religious perspectives. Mine is spiritual perspective. <laughs> so there's a complete difference. Spirituality is your self-work, your self working on the karma, shadow work, um, collective shadow work. Um, religion is a boxed in theory. Mm -hmm. And I'm closer to God than I've ever been before. And I'm out of religion. 
So, yeah. you know, I got myself out of the fish bowl or out of the fish tank and I'm swimming in the vast ocean. And uh, there's so many different avenues you could take with that. But the thing is, there's no condemnation with that. A loving God, it's not a, there's, it gets me really angry because I come from that world too. Most of the viewers know that. And it had me in such a fear. I had a hard time getting in my car and actually driving without a panic attack. Um, I had a, I almost um, crashed into a tractor trailer back in 2010. And um, if I did actually hit it, um, I probably would have, my head would have been, you know, because of tractor trailer. Um, the tractor trailer suddenly stopped on the highway and the sun got in my eyes and I had to slam on my brakes. I almost crashed into it. And so to me, that was like almost like a near death experience. I could not like, it was, it was a very uh, horrific experience. Um, I was shaking for hours after. And um, since that day I had gotten because of the church indoctrination, I was so afraid to drive a lot of the time, especially on a busy highway. Um, it was in the middle of Hartford, Connecticut. If anybody's driven through Hartford, Connecticut, that's a shit show. However, Bryce, I'm sure you have it worse in Atlanta. Um, yeah, so um, that was very scary for me. So I used to get these panic attacks and I was driving to and from work on this highway and I used to have to pull over all the time because I'd actually like, almost stop breathing. I'd get these horrific panic attacks. And that was all because I was so afraid to go to hell. Like, mm -hmm. how, like that's awful. No one should have to live like that. I don't care who you are. Jesus didn't teach that. No, mm -hmm. Jesus never told people they were going to hell. So yeah, I make it my life mission at this point to say, stop, stop believing these stupid They're indoctrinations. Lies. I mean, I've said it before. There is the most dishonest organization in this whole club is the church. Yeah, they literally lie about everything. And it's every everything. denomination. I don't yeah. care what denomination you're part of. It's a lie. And so, Total and lie. it doesn't mean there wasn't no God, no Jesus, no Mary Magdalene, whoever. It just means that they're boxing you in so that you are programmed and that you live in fear so you can be controlled. controlled. They use God, God wants us to willingly love God, not be forcefully loving God. I wouldn't want to force my kid to love me. That's wrong. Well, that goes against have, free will. Even if we have these moments of not loving God, it doesn't change the fact that you are a fractal of God. That's mm -hmm. um, Genesis 1, 3. God said, let there be light. That when I was doing my step, the word for light, the original Hebrew word meant divine spark. You are that. God said, let there be you. Mm -hmm. You really think that in those moments where you are mad at God or don't have that, that he's going to just forget about? No, you're his divine spark. His, her, we know that from the missing gospels too, that it's not just, it's a mother. They, as Joshua called mother, it, father, mother, father, 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 mother, father, God. Yeah. You are that, that is what you are. You are that fractal. And so it doesn't, and when you realize that there's so much liberation and there's no fear of death anymore. I mean, I don't want to die. I still got a lot of things I want to do in this, this world, but, but I'm not afraid of it. Same. I'm not afraid of it anymore. You know, it's, it's, um, it's life is exciting too, because that fear is gone. <laughs> And, um, and so with that karmic perspective, um, Emmy, I watched your video, video on ghosting that you did. And this is a, a modern term, uh, for something that's probably been going on for a very long time. And I think we, we, we know about it now because we have such an in your face communication devices with social media, with, um, cell phones, you know, when we were little kids, there was no internet. There was no, you know, there was no social media. You didn't have cell phones, you had landlines, you know? So I, I think these things happened, but it wasn't as apparent as they are now, which makes it even more. But I think, did you say in the video that this was a karmic a lesson, like a karmic lesson for everyone yeah. to go through? Yeah, I, <clears throat> as part of my healing and because I am learning um, so much about the law of attraction and trying to apply that to everything. Um, as part of my healing, I wanted to look at whom I may have hurt in this manner. Now, I haven't done anything to this degree, but I have done similar things. And it just got me thinking about, okay, are there people out there that I need to make amends to? And um, you know, a couple people immediately came to mind. And then as I was thinking about it over the next couple of weeks, 
um, I thought of, you know, a couple more people and, you know, the one person that I really wanted to reach out to and offer an apology, I have absolutely no way of contacting this person. I don't even know if this person still lives in the United States. So what I did was I just wrote a letter to him and said everything that I would normally say. And then I just burned it. And I think just, the, just taking the action in that respect, um, taking some kind of effort, putting it out there because everything's energy. Um, it, it, it completed, at least I feel it completed that cycle because I don't want to attract this kind of thing into my life ever again. It was, it was incredibly painful. You know, and when, for, you re- when you go through pain like that, you realize the pain that you maybe cause somebody else and it puts everything into perspective. Yes. That's when we talk about the shackles of liberation, when you start to actually value other human beings too, and you, you know, it's, it's, it's more of do unto others as you would have them do unto you. It's more of that empathetic, compassionate, we are all one really, mm-hmm. you know, and can you explain, I, we were talking about this before we started recording, um, the difference between like ghosting and like drifting apart. Cause there is a difference. And I think some people might be a little bit confused about the two. Okay. So ghosting is when you have a, uh, a sudden and very abrupt end in all communication. Like they just cut you all off and cut you out, you know, they and, and they make it so that you're not able to contact them. Um, they block you on social media, they'll block your phone number. Um, you know, they'll block YouTube channel or email, you know, there, there's a very abrupt end in all communication. Drifting apart is kind of a slower process where, you know, one or both people just kind of lose interest or they, you know, move on or, you know, what, you know what I'm talking about. There's no blocking. You're probably there's still no friends with that person on social money. You still call that person. It's just, yeah. 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 No ill intent. Yeah. No, no ill intent, no ill intent at all whatsoever. Um, and what's particularly painful about ghosting is social rejection, um, activates the same parts of your brain that are activated during physical pain. And so when I say ghosting hurts, I mean, it literally physically hurts and there are, a few types of trauma that are created when this happens. You know, you have grief uh, from the loss of the relationship and the void that that creates. You've got the physical pain and you have this, um, this state of rumination or ambiguity or a constant wondering in your mind because they didn't offer you any closure. So you're grieving their loss your brain is constantly trying to figure out uh, why, trying to constantly make sense of something that makes no sense. And at the same time, you know, you could be physically hurting. Like it is, it is a really shitty experience. Mm -hmm. Really. It really is. You know, I, I feel really bad for people who are dating. (laughs) This happens, you know, from the research, a little bit of research that I did, this happens a lot with online dating, it's, it's almost like people view other people as just an avatar that they can swipe right, you know, and we kind of lose the connection um, and the empathy that we would normally have with a face-to-face person or a face-to-face relationship. Right. And there's integrity too in finding closure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Missing when that there's just a, an abrupt end like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, one thing too, that really, really helped me was taking a stance of non-judgment, you know, because one hurtful act doesn't make a person evil. And, you know, I've done, I've done similar stuff like this in my past. And I, when I did it, I wasn't even thinking about it. I had like a complete disregard and lack of empathy for how that may have made, made him feel like it just did not even cross my mind. I was, you know, I, I wanted what I wanted and I was going after it and I was kind of one track minded and tunnel vision. And 
um, you know, it was very eye opening having this happen. And, you know, when I thought about that person, I was just like, wow, that was a really crappy thing for me to do. Really crappy. Um, so yeah, it's very eye opening. And, you know, I'm, I'm sure that I wouldn't have want, wanted him to judge me or look down on me or say that I'm a horrible, evil person. I'm not a horrible, evil per- person. And, you know, I don't look at these ladies like they're horrible, evil people. Um, you know, maybe uh, they need a little bit of work in their communication and um, maybe the reasoning and the justification behind the reasoning that they do things. Um, but I have no interest in passing judgment or being angry or, you know, holding things against people. Now, if they were to come back into my life, I'd probably, you know, be reserved and cautious. Um, I probably would not have the same kind of relationship that I thought I had um, during the months that we uh, were friends. Um, But I think that forgiveness you know, as we're moving into new earth, I think that love and compassion and forgiveness is so incredibly important. And to try to look at the people who hurt you with understanding. Yeah. Um, So, yeah. That's huge because it kind of goes into that area of betrayal, which Mm -hmm. is something I've, I've had to work on for like the past five months is, um, and it's, it's hard once someone's betrayed your trust it's really hard to like walk into that territory of trusting, potentially trusting that person again, but it is possible. I believe there is possibility of redemption and putting yourself in that other person's shoes is an incredible way to start that healing process of mending that, that, that trust back, whether that's in a friendship or romantic relationship or whatever. Um, But yeah, you're right. And I, I, um, and, but it does take, it does take, in order to, to step back, it takes a lot of communication and um, a lot of tears, probably on both ends, <laughs> apart and together, you know, to work through it. And tears are amazing. Tears are a release. They're, they're a way to release that, um, those held feelings. And um, so, yeah, I, I like that you say, you talk about potentially, yeah. And that's okay when, when that type of betrayal has happened to be a little bit more to test the waters more because, um, because once bitten twice shy, but there is healing. There's always, there's always hope for a second chance, you know? Mm. And sometimes, I mean, sometimes when healing has been done on both parts, the relationship comes back stronger too. Yes. My marriage, my marriage is a perfect example of that. My husband and I are twin flames and I didn't realize that's the kind of relationship that we had until about a year ago. And when I started researching and learning and diving deep into twin flames, everything made sense. Everything made sense. And with the betrayal that we've had in our relationship, working through it and coming uh, through to the other side has built this foundation and this trust in our relationship that would not have been there otherwise. You know, it, it is amazing when two people who have grown up in families and been hurt so deeply and had such trauma and such abuse, and they can come together and work through their stuff and come out the other side and still be together. It, it is an embodiment of unconditional love. And it is such an honor to be able to watch my husband's growth, watch my growth, watch how we are together as a couple and be able to share that with other people. It's just, I'm so grateful. It has been so hard, so hard. Like I would not, I would not want to do it again. I would not want to go through some of the stuff that we've went through again. However, I'm so grateful that, that we did and that we made it through on the other side and that we're, we're continuing to grow and, um, I'm getting all teary eyed. <laughs> Steph and I have talked about this. Like people get people romanticize the twin flame thing, and it's it's no, it's, it's nothing wrong. to romanticize about. If you got a good soulmate, <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. If you've got yourself a soulmate or a kindred spirit, you're, you're on good. cloud nine because twin it's, flame relationships are work intense. Well, and that's the intense. thing too is, and I've done my research um, on the twin flame thing. It's like 
there has to be. I've noted that. I don't, I don't know how I can explain that correctly, but usually you meet your twin and then you get like pulled apart by something. It always happens that way. And then that's when like the tower moment happens for both of you. And then you come back together again. It's, it's like the most bizarre karmic thing. Like, and you're the twin flame guys. It's when the soul splits into two. It's like, why did, why did I do this again? Like, why did I decide yes. I need to be two people? Like this is a little psychotic. This is a little psychotic. Like, you have to do yeah. a lot of work on yourself in order for it to work. Yeah. Cause mm -hmm. your twin's going to mirror you. So, um, and, and a lot of times too, uh, the whole twin flame journey too it's inevitable you're going to get hit with like tons of spiritual warfare because you have to it's part of the journey and uh it's um no no joke no walk in the park it's nothing to romanticize about and uh it's uh sometimes like can we abort mission <laughs> <laughs> abort 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 <laughs> i want to like Call mine and be like, why do we agree to do this? Like, this is yeah, bullshit. Well, I, I, I don't even know personally. No, I, I know who it is. I just don't know them in person. And it's like, yeah, it's uh, not on the same wavelength just yet. You know what I mean? Like, it's, um, and I'm sitting here like, would you just pull your head out of your ass already? <laughs> <laughs> Well, usually, um, this is interesting too, like with twin, you, you could be like, you could look totally different from your twin. Like you could be different races, all that kind of stuff. But, um, usually you'll have like the same ear. That's what's so weird. You'll have like the exact yes. same ear and hand. like, it's, it's bizarre. It is the, the lines on the hands are, mm -hmm. are like, can be identical. I believe. Yeah. The ears are and similar. The ear, there's like the fingerprint. And so like, you know, like you'll have the same like type of ear, like it's, it's really strange because if the, if the body and I'm saying guys, you don't have to be identical. Like you can be a different race for your twin could be black. You could be white, Asian, white, black. It doesn't matter, but there's just little parts of your physical because the body again is the Shakti of the soul. So well, like for instance, not to interrupt you, Bryce, but for instance, a hand, you're going to have your, there's different lines on your hands that indicate your soul journey. So if you've gone, if you're in a twin flame journey, obviously your journey is going to be very similar. So like that, that long lifeline that goes like here <clears throat> will be the same length. You know what I mean? Um, well, what's wild. I've, I've read a lot and it explains because all of my most successful relationships have been with men who are like 10 to 15 years older than me. But then I was researching it and it's common in twin flame relationships for the man to actually be older than the female, even though the female is the one that activates the relationship su subconscious. Most of the time she doesn't even know. M most of the time she has no, that doesn't have a clue. She's that's what she's doing in my situation. I didn't even know any of this when it happened. So you know, it's, it's, um, it's very interesting that there's these like patterns, but if you think about the body being the Shakti of the soul, the expression of the soul, and you are really literally the same soul into two different human experiences, there are going to be things that are signs on the physical body. Yeah. You're going to have a lot of the same, like similar experiences in life, whether that be like a lot of paranormal experiences, same sicknesses, like all sorts of stuff is going to be very similar in your life paths before you actually meet each other. And, and the shitty thing is when we come to the, the earth, we're going through the veil of amnesia. So mm -hmm. we, we come here and we don't know any of this. And um, I don't know, Emmy, if I've told you, I, I was in the, the bath one night reading uh, my murder mysteries that I love. That's how I relax guys at night as I put some Epsom salts in the bath and I, I read my whodunits. I'm like an old lady. I want my stories, my stories, you know, like it's like uh, uh, Agatha Christie and, you know, I, I, I love it. But anyway, I was in the bath and I was reading this like freaking murder mystery. And all of a sudden I had this, what I thought was a vision. And I saw myself, I've seen what my higher self looks like. So I kind of know what she looks like. Um, she's way more elegant than I am, <laughs> but yeah, um, I'm too. <laughs> um, I was walking down this hallway with this, with my twin and all these angels were bowing and I did not want to do it. I absolutely did not want to do what we were about to do and that we were about to come here to this earth. And I remember actually sitting down and being pulled down into this light. But before we went into the room where we were going to be pulled into these, like, like I remember watching him just down into this light. 
um, I like walking down, he like s- stopped and just, he said my galactic name, which I know what it, I'm not going to say it on the air. And he said, I, I will find you. And that was like the last thing that was said before we went into the little tunnels of light. I know that sounds people watching, but it's like you crazy girl, but, um, but it's wild. And I thought it was just a vision. But then one of our friends who works in this and this quantum stuff, she was like, no, 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 that was a memory. That's a common memory that people have. But when they start to remember, like coming into this density, they act, that's the same memory of coming, you know, the way that I described coming down to earth, but um, it's weird. Time is weird because in that memory, we came down at the same time, but usually the man is, and our physical world will be a little bit older, but time is relative anyway. So it's all wild guys. Like it is, it is. And they will trigger you. Your twins will trigger you like no one else. And it's because they are, because you. it's a mirror of you. I mean, mm-hmm. so I know like a lot of the twin flame journey too, like you're, you could, one can grow up in the inner city and one girl in the cut co- grow up in the country, but you might have like similar things that happen to you. Like, certain childhood traumas, um, certain medical illnesses, certain uh, spiritual attacks, and they're very, they're almost identical. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's like, because it's a mirror, you go through a lot of the similar experiences, regardless of your age, like, yeah, I like, my twin will be older than me. So, you know, but I, I have a little bit of a background to know that there, there's definitely that, like, it's a weird mirror. It's almost creepy. Like yeah. that's how identical it is. It's as if you do have like an identical twin sibling, but it's not a sibling. It's, it's very, in, it's, it's unique. I hope not. Cause most of them turn out to be romantic. So you don't want it to be with your sibling. <laughs> so they can be, they're rare occasions. Yeah. Where well, Isis and Osiris were twin flames and they were siblings supposedly. Then again, the powers that be could have easily manipulated that story. So yeah. who the hell knows? Yeah. Yeah. You, there have been instances and in, in, with twin flame journey, some twins will never like be romantic. That's rare though. Rare. Most of the time they, they do end up romantic. Cause it's, it's that, it's that Plato symposium. Um, it's the Hedwig and the angry inch, that musical there. Um, there's um, the origins of love, which was a song based off of, of uh, Plato symposium where they talk about being divided <laughs> and pulled apart. And then, um, when you're making love, you're literally trying to put yourself back together, which is why when we're reading in the Magdalene manuscript, that's why the, the Kundalini is activated with usually with twins. You are the only person. I mean, you can do stuff to activate your, your Kundalini on your own, but with twins relationships, usually with intimacy, that is the person that is going to really trigger that activation when you're intimate with your twin is because it is the soul. It's the same soul. Does that make sense? Yeah. The yeah. church that they don't teach you this at vacation Bible school. <laughs> no, no, not at all. The the <laughs> day that the day that my husband and I met, um, when he was standing in front of me, I had to try with all of my might not to show my enthusiasm because it was like take my breath away. Like I just, I instantly fell in love. It was like I didn't know what a chakra was, like I was saying earlier, but when he was standing in front of me, literally all of them came online. <laughs> well, they talk about the heart chakra. I, I actually was just re, uh, in the video I released um, part three, they talk about the heart. Um, there's a response with the heart. There's some like magneticism that happens. Like I've even heard stories where even the simple touch, it's like a spark. It's almost like a like, yeah. it's, it's almost like, um, and I wouldn't know this just yet, but this is just what I've heard. And I've done a lot of research on the twin flame journey. Um, and, and oftentimes too, it isn't somebody you met, like when you're a teenager or anything, cause you yeah, got to work through your shit, obviously. But, um, which is by the way, like, that's why a lot of marriages are crumbling because of that, or it's like a, a, a high level soulmate, you know, that God is going to put you in union with. So like a lot of karmic relationships are now ripping away. But um, from what I read, like, there's like, literally like, it's almost like an electric spark when you touch that person, just like a, like a poke on the shoulder, even. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there was, there was definitely um, a major energy exchange. And, you know, I, I will say that 
one of the most amazing things um, for me and, and my husband and our twin flame journey is the sex. The sex life is like nothing else. I mean, it is out well. of this world. <laughs> <laughs> out of this world so <laughs> <laughs> one of the benefits of being a human right although i hear that on venus i've been obsessed with this for a while the venetians apparently they don't have thumbs and all they do is have sex all day all right. well but apparently the thumb is how we do you know the pow pow things and all you know the thumb is what kind of got us into trouble as humans although i'd feel very naked without my thumb but um Venus, they don't have thumbs and they just have sex all day. So <laughs> good to know. So guys, if you want a good vacation in the future, just take the portal over to Venus. <laughs> that's why, that, <laughs> might be the went, better, that might be the better pick <laughs> in this gangster planet. So yeah, it's, it's, um, you know, I, I, uh, I knew a lot cause I've, I'm a huge, obviously i I'm a huge philosophy lover. And so I've studied Plato symposium before I studied the twin flame stuff before, but I never really took it seriously until all of a sudden I realized what was going on with me. And I realized, and I realized everything after the tower moment had happened. I was like super dumb before I had no idea. Like what, cause you know, you just don't think about that kind of stuff. But, but I think that this um, great awakening kind of accelerated understandings for people in a lot of ways and like it's like it's like pandora's box even though opening pandora's box was a bad thing but it kind of like you can't what is it charlie ward says you can't get the shit back in the horse like once you make that realization you can't get the shit back in the horse once you see it you can't see it and um and so yeah I, I do want people to understand though not everybody has a twin flame this is it's it's um only rare. a small it's very rare actually a small group and and it's not it's not what it's it's not Yes. When I think when you're in harmony with your twin, it could be a very um, powerful relationship. Uh, but before that, there's a lot of pain. And so um, if, if that's, if you have a high level soulmate and you have a really great relationship, like I am you, you know, <laughs> you know, like, like that's not, it, am I making sense? Like, it's not something mm -hmm. that you to be envious of if, if that's not where you are in this life that's okay you know it's okay wherever you are it's where you are that's where you're supposed to be so yeah but i'll take your word for it emmy that the sex is good <laughs> <laughs> and i always get wrapped up in this conversation when i'm on a video with price it's the ace of cups baby it's the ace of cups it's your fault this time it's emmy's fault so <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad. I'm glad she shared that tidbit of information. Ace of cups. Ace of cups. Ace of cups all the way. Ace of cups all the way. Feed me grapes and tell me it's real with that ace of cups. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but it's all. It's all. You know, when we're going through hard stuff, like when we're we're going through anything that's painful or hard, whether that's ghosting or going through the twin flame journey, there's always a purpose for it. And that's kind of the, the main thing I really, when we talk about the karma, it's like, don't avoid your karma because on the other side of that is something really good. Mm. You know, the sun does shine again. Yeah. Absolutely. Bigger and brighter. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it made me think about something. You know how Adam and Eve walked around the world naked before the first sin, supposedly? I really hope we're not going back to that. I, just think <laughs> they were naked. I think that was metaphoric for um, they weren't. I mean, if you read the Apocryphon of John, which I really like the Apocryphon of John, they, they tell the Adam and Eve story in a very different way, <laughs> very different way um, that uh, the releasing of Adam and Eve from the garden was the good God because they were in a prison. Interesting. Mm. I'm going to have to get that book. Actually, I know you read it on your channel, but I haven't watched it yet. So I'm going to have to watch that. Talks about Sophia, which the mother god, Sophia. Uh, Lucifer in that is called Yeldabaoth, which I think is the best name for Lucifer that I've heard thus far, Yeldabaoth. Um, and uh, Yeldabaoth basically, it, it talks, it, it gets lauded to like the law of one where darkness can't create, only light can create. So everything that's created was, was created by the light. It's also just been inverted by the dark because darkness can't create anything. So even the serpent, which I actually spoke about this with David Zublick today, we talk about the serpent um, being, you know, that's the, the symbol for Satan is the serpent. 
But the serpent actually represents Kundalini, which is the rising of Christ consciousness. So of course, of course they took the serpent and made it bad because they don't want your Christ conscious. Right. Could you imagine what would happen to the church if everybody's Kundalini rose? Yeah. <laughs> we're done. We'd I be mean, Venus. You would be on Venus. <laughs> yeah. Like hologram Pope, would, literally that projector would have to be turned off for hologram Pope because no one would care anymore. No one yep. would listen to him anymore. No one was just in Mary Magdalene practice Kundalini rising. So I don't want to hear from the church. I know. Uh, yeah. <laughs> That's she, what activated his cow body, like his light body. Yeah. You know, was, so was trained they, in a, they made sex such a dirty thing and it's not supposed to be that way. I mean, it can be used as a dirty thing and it has been, but. That's not the originality of it. That's not the purpose of it. Um, it's, a, it's supposed to be a beautiful thing. And uh, yeah. Yeah. There's good sex magic and there's bad sex magic. Um, harnessing a incubus or a succubus, like the story they tell us about the Virgin Mary where she was impregnated by a spirit. That's what they do in their, their rituals. Mm -hmm. the good sex magic is two consenting adults raising vibration together through an a very intimate act. So we have to start reprogramming the way we think about that. Now, Emmy, for people, do you do services for people? Yes. Um, I have been practicing Reiki for two and a half years. Um, mainly I've been working with uh, friends and family. I do have uh, a few paying clients. I am working on building my business. My business name is called Abundant Life Holistic. You have a website? And, um, not yet. I'm building it. I do have an email, Emmy at Abundant Life Holistic is my, my business email. And the services that I offer are Reiki uh, treatments of, of all kinds. And, and we could do a whole entire show on what can be healed with Reiki, little, literally everything. It's so versatile. Okay. And the other service I'm going to be offering um, is intuitive, um, holistic astrology readings. I'm studying a, um, a variation of astrology called aspect pattern astrology, and it takes the shapes that the um, aspects make, the different points and planets in your chart, the, the, they make these geometrical shapes, and you can look at the shapes as a whole and interpret based on where the planets and points are, what house they're in, and it, it gives a much more holistic interpretation of the chart instead of just piece by piece, which, you know, there's nothing wrong with piece by piece astrology. But when you read a chart that way, sometimes there's contradictions. Mm -hmm. And um, I just like, I just like a holistic approach to, to everything. You know, when you take into account the entire person and all the uh, layers and facets that we all have, it gives us a, a better picture of, you know, where we've been, where we are now, where we're going, what things uh, we may need to work on, what challenges we may be facing, that kind of stuff. So yeah, those are, those are the two things that I'm going to focus on. And it's been, it's been uh, challenging narrowing it down because I love reading cards. I love dousing. I love like all of the spiritual stuff. I just love it. Like sound healing, um, crystals, all of it. But I'm, I'm super busy. I have um, seven children and a stepdaughter and I homeschool some of my kids and uh, I'm still a part-time nanny. So my life is very full and I'm doing all this in addition to, so, so yeah. For a woman right over now, here. <laughs> I will put your email address down in the description box below as well for any students or any students listen to me like I'm at Ashala, any subscribers who want to, who want to um, contact you for any, any, possible services. Is that okay? Absolutely. Yes, and I'll put it in my description box as well. So let's okay. do it. Let's plan another show. Um, maybe we can get a round table of different healers on and talk about all the different modalities and all that kind of stuff with, with healing. And that sounds amazing. Yeah, yeah that sounds great. Absolutely. Cool. Awesome. Well, thank you ladies so much. I know it's been about an hour. Thank you guys so much for listening. 
Um, and Stephanie, are you still opening up your support groups? We did talk a lot about the church. If, are you still, do you still want me to put your email up for people who maybe need? We're going to put a hold on that for a second. Cause I'm very behind on those emails. I just got my tarot email under control. Now I got to get that one under control. Um, I'm actually letting go a lot of my groups at this point. I'm only, I'm only, um, holding on to two of them that I will be running and the rest of them will be run by other people at this point. So going forward, I'm going to be making, um, one new group at a time. Um, and then um, after a couple of weeks of those groups forming, I will let that one go into the hands of someone that is trustworthy and reliable. Um, so I am looking, um, I did have some people reach out to be leaders of groups earlier on in this journey of my groups. However, um, I probably will be reaching out to those people at some point or um, trying to, you know, get to know certain people in these new groups and um, choosing somebody who volunteers themselves for it. Um, because at this point in the journey, I'm being told by my specific spiritual guides um, through, the, through the veil here that I need to start letting go of that because I really need to focus on other things. And plus, I'm a mom as well. So it's kind of like a juggling act, like what Emmy's doing. <laughs> um, so it's I've had to really like, do a lot of um, working on time management and putting um, things in the proper priority order um, and that sort of thing. So it's been a challenge, but I'm getting there. And I've had wonderful friends that have helped me. Um, so yeah. So uh, once, that so will be that, later time. I'm sorry, what? And once so once you open it back up again, we'll put the email. Yeah, up. once I open it back up right now, I need to kind of seal it off a little bit only because I'm still working on trying to figure out where what I'm doing, what groups I'm holding on to, um, and that sort of thing. So, yeah. Well, and I would encourage people in your own area. If, if that's something you feel like you need a support system, find people like you in your area. I promise you there yeah. are people that are just like you, um, that are starting to question the church as well, you know, which we need to, honestly, guys, we question education. We've questioned medicine. We've questioned government. We have to question the church because it's part of it. It's part of it. Head of it. So, do I, it's the head of it. Yes, yeah, the head of the head. snake. It's a snake head, yeah. yeah. It's just the head of it. So, um, and FYI, guys, Jesus didn't leave the church to Peter. That was changed in the Bible. <sighs> Ruffle those feathers, Bryce. In the, in those the, feathers. Thing, in the missing books, <laughs> did not leave that to Peter. So, um, I never thought that. Peter was an asshole. He was a narcissist. You read about that. I always thought he left it to Mag Magdalene, Mary Magdalene. But Imagine there's there's a lot more to this story that we probably don't yeah. even know. Yeah. So and that will come out eventually. But yeah. question everything, including an, any organization. Yeah, absolutely. All right, ladies. So again, everybody, I'll put their their links down in the description box below. And until next time, we will see you guys soon. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.